Good evening and thank you for once again joining us for our hopefully first annual environmental speaker series, uh, an initiative put together through a partnership between the Niagara Parks and Brock University's Environmental Sustainability Research Center. My name is Heather Gorman and I'm the Manager of Education and Public Programming for the Niagara Parks Commission and I'm so happy to welcome you all tonight. I am joined as always by my associates from Brock University, Amanda Smith, and the Director of the Environmental Sustainability Research Center, Ryan Plummer. Throughout tonight's presentation, if you have any questions for our speaker, please feel free to write it in the comment or question box on your screen, and Ryan will direct your questions to our presenter following her discussion. Tonight, I have the immense pleasure to welcome our guest, Elizabeth Hendricks from WWF Canada, as she discusses her topic, connecting the land, water, and climate impact to the region. Elizabeth has 15 years of experience working nationally and internationally on water policy. In her capacity as Vice President of WWF Canada's Fresh Water Program, she led the 2017 release of Watershed Reports. She is leading the freshwater team in efforts to reverse the decline of freshwater ecosystems across the country with the intersection of technology, policy, and community building. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and I will turn the reins over to you. Thank you so much. I am going to take my time, make sure I'm sharing properly. All right, unless I hear otherwise, I will assume everything is going fine. So thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be speaking to everyone tonight. Um, great initiative and really wonderful to see this, these types of partnerships and the ability to deliver online in these strange and unusual times. First, I wanna do a land acknowledgement. Today, I'm speaking to you from my home in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and home to many diverse Indigenous people. I want to acknowledge that while many participants are likely from the Niagara region, there could be participants from many places. Please share where you're from, and it's always nice to see how people are showing up. And with this land acknowledgement, I ask that we each take a moment to consider why we do land acknowledgements as treaty people, also, how are we in relationship with people on and with the land? Thank you for taking some time to think about those relationships. And today, I have to say, this is my first, I've been doing lots of webinars in these new times, but this is my first public lecture, and I'm trying to weave in more personal stories, so I'm taking a new approach, and we'll see how, this, how things go tonight. So I work for WWF Canada. I'm the VP of the Restoration and Regeneration Pro, um, Program. And WWF Canada has been in Canada for over 50 years. So it's an international network, but WWF Canada really mostly works within Canada. We have offices in Toronto as our main office, our um, head office, but we work coast to coast to coast in Atlantic Canada, Quebec, in the far north in Nunavut and BC. We're both a science-based conservation organization and we do do advocacy. I've been with the organization almost nine years, uh, actually almost 10 years, sorry, in a few months. And I have to say it's been an incredible journey and I feel um, very grateful for the work I get to do at this organization. So the next few slides, I am gonna take us down a bit of a sad rabbit hole of a story. But don't worry, I promise to end on a high note of hope and um, that there are things to do that we can do. So we are facing this dual crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss. I think it's not news that climate is a global crisis and um, it's impacting countries around the world and communities. Yep. Um, w, uh, Canada holds, though, good news. 
Um, oh, sorry, with the dual crisis, sorry, climate change is one of the crises. The second crisis is biodiversity loss, uh, largely due to habitat and destruction. Uh, this map is the world's remaining intact ecosystems. And I just want to point out um, that Canada holds the second largest area of intact nature, but it's not all rosy over here. You can see along the southern border, this gray area, but there's lots of habitat degradation. And it, it also aligns where all the people in Canada live. And with this incredible global endowment comes this also this incredible responsibility. We need to protect what is intact and restore what is degraded. So I think you can see where it's highly um, human dominated areas. So Southern Ontario, um, the grassland area, the prairies, all gray uh, where we've degraded a lot of our ecosystems. In terms of biodiversity loss, nearly half of Canada's wildlife populations are in steep decline, and the main cause is habitat loss. Destruct the destruction and disruption of areas where they find food and water, um, where raise, raise their young, escape predators, migrate, and hibernate. The impacts of industrial activities like deforestation, pollution, and unsustainable mining and large-scale energy production are an increasingly threatening wildlife survival, even as climate change creates unprecedented new problems. Climate change in Canada is fairly frightful as well. Uh, past and future warming in Canada is two times the global rate, and in northern Canada, uh, we've, it's, we're seeing a warming rate that's more than double the global rate. So these maps, I'll just point out, um, demonstrate warming in winter, spring, summer, and autumn. So acceleration happening in the winter as well. Now, I just wanna take also some time to speak to fresh water and specifically fresh water in Canada. I did um, this title of this presentation is Land and Water and Climate Change. Um, this is a great map. I love it because we're so rich in fresh water. It's Canada's mapped, Canada mapped by rivers, lakes, and streams. So six or 20% of our fresh, uh, Canada holds 20% of uh, global fresh water. 60% of that water flows north. 60%, I, I've known this statistic for as long as I've you know, worked in the water world and it always astounds me how much actually flows north. And yet 85% of the Canadian population live along the country's southern borders. And according to RBC's uh, Na National Water Survey, Water Attitude Survey, Canadians rank water as the most important natural resource ahead of oil and gas. So it's tempting to think that our crises around water is someone else's problems, um, but we do have a water problem and part of it is not understanding it. Canadian, Canada's lakes and rivers face major threats from pollution, overuse of water, habitat loss, and fragmentation, alteration of flow, climate change we've already spoken about, and invasive species. These threats are affecting the health of watersheds and the wildlife that depend on them. On the Pacific coast, freshwater dependent wildlife declined by 14% on average between 1970 and 2017. And in Lake Ontario, much closer to home, Native fish species have dropped 32% on average between 1992 and 2014. Despite the threats and wildlife declines, freshwater habitats are largely unprotected and understudied. We just don't know how freshwater habitats are doing. This is why we released the Watershed Reports. It's the first national scale assessment of the health and threats to freshwater in Canada. As a national organization, WWF Canada is uniquely placed to connect to monitoring groups and organizations nationwide, ensuring as much data as possible is considered when evaluating the health and threats to Canada's fresh water. So actually just yesterday, so hot off the press, we released uh, Watershed Reports 2020. And I would love for you guys to check out the national report. I'll give you kind of the high level um, results is that there are 167 sub watersheds in Canada. 
Of those with data, 64% receive good or very good scores, which is really great. I think, okay, our, maybe we're doing okay on the health of our waters. Unfortunately, of six, only 60% of subwatersheds have the data. So actually, to clarify a bit, we have 167 watersheds, 100 we don't have data to understand. So we actually only understand the health of 67 watersheds. But, you know, we're not talking all of Canada and I do want to bring bring it down to the Great Lakes region um, and specifically, oh, oops, I'm just looking at the map and I see it's called Northern Lake Erie Great Lakes. I just want to make sure I've cut and paste the right watershed and I have, thank you for the Niagara Peninsula. So overall health in this region is fair, which is okay given the amount of disruption that we see on the land. Um, water quality is again okay. We don't, um, our fish is, seem, is good, which is a really um, important uh, part of an ecosystem health. Benthic invertebrates, which often people are like, what does that even mean? Is the little bugs on the bottom of the river and they're really important in terms of indicator of a health of an ecosystem and that's data depletion. So it's okay, I think we can do better in this region and given how much habitat destruction has happened in this region, I think um, we can definitely do better. So don't worry, that was all very depressing. We can and we we can and we need to do differently. Um, a Canada with abundant wildlife where nature and people thrive is, you know, we all deserve that. Um, and that's been our basic mission for over 50 years. But we've been evolving at WWF and over the next decade, we really wanna combat this dual crisis of biodiversity loss and climate change, harnessing the power of nature restoration. A key focus for WWF um, is natural re restoration, and here's why. Nature has been called the sleeping giant in the climate crisis. Its role in greenhouse gas level is threefold. Nature features, nature features store carbon, release carbon to the atmosphere, and remove carbon from the atmosphere. By restoring land and marine coastal zones, we can reduce emissions to the atmosphere by increasing carbon capture potential. These activities have a additional potential to strengthen habitat and the well being of local communities. Large scale restoration of habitat can create conditions for natural carbon capture and potentially long term storage, resulting in reduced greenhouse gas emissions over the lifetime of the plant. Smaller scale efforts in urban regions can contribute as well. This approach is beneficial not only for climate considerations, but also improving wildlife habitat. Forests, wetlands, shoreline, green spaces, and other ground cover capture and store carbon that could otherwise be released into the atmosphere as greenhouse gas emissions. The loss and destruction of these carbon sinks not only drives the climate crisis, causing more frequent, frequent wildfires, droughts, and other extreme weather events, but also contributes to dramatic loss of wildlife habitat. At WWF, we also recognize the importance of considering different knowledge systems and have attempted to embrace a two-eyed seeing approach. Combines the strength of both indigenous and non-indigenous perspectives for a more holistic and integrative approach to conservation. Ultimately, in indigenous-led conservation is vital to advancing reconciliation and renewing relationships with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. For conservation to be equitable and just, we need to support Indigenous knowledge, governance, sovereignty, and leadership. Our role in this work, our role in the work, we'll be learning more about, and we'll be learning, sorry, we'll be learning more how to do this as we um, increase our, the type and different types of work we do. So what is the different types of work we do? Much of these efforts, 
um, that we are working on is realized through massive restoration and stewardship of forests, wetlands, grasslands, and shorelines. This will not only increase and improve habitat for at-risk species, restoration also helps mitigate and adapt to climate change by absorbing and storing carbon, as well as adding natural green in infrastructure that creates resilience to climate fueled wild, wildfires, floods, and other disastrous effects. Restoration makes sense everywhere, but particularly here in Canada, where our iconic nature has been progressively degraded and destroyed by human activities. In Ontario alone, 70% of wetlands have been drained since colonization. And we are seeing successes from our restoration efforts. Restoration is a complex process requiring the right action in the right places for the right outcomes. Otherwise, positive impacts will be much less than what's possible. But right now, we are in a brief but potentially transformative moment where anything and everything is possible, and we really believe we need to seize that together. One of the primary ways we work in, res in restoration at WWF Canada is by empowering great work on the ground. Using our expertise, we identify areas and actions with the greatest need and opportunity, and then identify the right partners to drive impact. When we offer capacity to help those partners achieve conservation impact and tell those stories, at w and to tell those stories, at WWF, we know we can't be everywhere, but across Canada, we're stronger when we work together. So over the years, through programs like our uh, Loblaw Water Fund, we've already begun this type of work. Um, these supported groups on the ground doing restoration or monitoring of freshwater ecosystems. And through the six years we ran this program, we empowered some incredible results. We used the watershed reports to help identify those areas of greatest potential impact. So while the introduction to my slides, you know, were pretty heavy handed, dual climate crisis, the, you know, how fresh water is faring across the country. We use that science and that science is really important to drive how and where we do our work. So over six years, we were able to use our reports to drive where we work and had incredible impact. I want to, you know, narrow down a bit more to the Carolinian zone, which is where Niagara sits, um, and be a bit more specific about how we work in this region. As I said, there's been a, this incredible decline of wildlife across the country. The Carolinian zone is less than 1% of Canada's land mass, yet home to 25% of Canadians. It's a biodiversity hotspot with the highest number of rare and at-risk species, but it's also 95% of land that's privately owned. So really unique and interesting place to try and get conservation impact. Just to highlight in case um, folks aren't from the Carolinian zone, but the Carolinian zone kind of reaches beyond Toronto and all the way to Windsor. And it's actually a very eco uh, unique, the only zone, Carolinian zone in North America. Um, so very ecologically unique and very rich. So like we mentioned, 82% of Canadians live in urban areas and this and 25% of Canadians live in this region. So the work and it's, you know, we've already mentioned 95% of it of land is privately owned. So when we looked at this region and we looked at the you know, biodiversity devastation, climate change impacts, the impact of freshwater health, how we focus our conservation is incredibly important. It's like, what strategies are we going to use to get the impact? So in this region, we really have to develop programs that are around homeowners and other private landowners because they're really, you know, going to be the key lever in increasing the level of healthy, resilient, and native habitat in the Carolinian zone. Our In the Zone program is about engaging gardeners, but also municipalities, those private land and all other private land owners to grow native plants 
and it's about resilient habitat. So I picked the title of this program because what we do on the land impacts the water. So when we're looking at addressing the scary crises of climate change and biodiversity, we need to recognize that there's this relationship between land and water and they both matter. So, you know, replacing and restoring and regenerating all the land we possibly can, can isn't just good for the soil, but it's good for the plants, it's good for uh, wildlife, and it's good for, we'll get results in fresh water as well. In the Zone offers resources for how to plant. Um, it I, um, in the Zone provides tools and support. We have an online portal um, that helps people understand how to plant, and um, it also provides expert advice, but also about measuring and monitoring. So we really want to um, monitor impact and assessment so that over the course of the next 10 years, for us, it's, we work in these 10 year um, timeframes, we really want to track our progress and say, hey, we had these crises, but we really focused on restoration and regeneration and returning the health of fresh water. And we were able to track it through things like our garden tracker. The Garden Tracker, just a, um, it's a really unique tool. Um, check it out online. But it sets your baseline and it gives you um, those materials and the resources. And it also helps you count your garden or your private land towards improving Carolinian habitat. And it's really focused on growing wild habitat, connectivity. So, you know. Alone, we could argue, oh, what is one plant? You know, the pessimists in the room will say, what does one garden mean? But it's really about that connectivity and seeing that you can have a community of uh, gardens that have returned to um, native plants, and then you see how it can scale up. It's also about it getting climate smart gardens and restoration going and com um, community connections. Um, we really believe that is the power of positivity and um, growing a different culture in our country. So, oh, sorry. Before I sign off, I do didn't mention, but it occurred to me just as we were joining the um, the webinar that we also have really strong and actually how I got connected to this partnership was through our Living Planet at Campus and climate resiliency work. So WWF partners in a range of ways that we invite anyone on the call to also um, partner with us. So we're partnered with Brock University, both in our Living Planet at Campus programs, but also in our resilient climate work. Um, so there's research, there's, if you're a student, please get involved, contact us, the Living Planet at Campus work, really exciting ways to address climate and biodiversity issues, but also some sustainability issues on your campus. Um, we love it when people get out and monitor or restore with us in the Carolinian zone, all the restoration that needs to be done can be done by us. Uh, we really encourage and love, you know, use your voice, whether it's through local programming, and I think, um, folks in this partnership really advocate that getting involved in community partnership, you know, we will build stronger wildlife and nature when we all have our voice and donate. And that's not just donate to WWF by any means, but donate to your local um, conservation organizations. Conservation happens on the ground in our backyard. That's where Canadians, I've always seen when Canadians care about what's happening in their backyard. Um, and they can get really involved. And so I really encourage, especially um, in this unruly time of COVID, where I think we're all getting out in nature a lot more than before, it's a time to support those community groups who can provide really safe programming on the ground. And I think with that, I am done. And I wanna say thank you so much for having me. And I will be open for for questions. Thank you. Ryan, I can't hear you though.
I think you might be muted. Oh, I think I'm good now. Can you hear me now, Liz? I can hear you. Wonderful. So I just want to, first of all, say thank you so much for that captivating presentation. You indicated it was your, your first one, and uh, I, was, I would never have guessed that. So just thank you so much. <laughs> everybody out there a quick warning that on my one hand I'm trying to hold my dog because apparently coyotes up here are uh, ex extremely active this evening so I apologize for that uh, up front but of course it's COVID and we'll we'll try to roll with it. Um, Liz while, while I want to give people a chance to um, you know have their questions I just wanted to say I guess a couple reflections based on your presentation if I can. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, uh, you know, first say just how uh, kind of thought-provoking it was to think of the multiple crises that we're facing uh, at the same time, and how you know those those crises really intersect, and and it's at that intersection point um, that we have to really aim our efforts. And so when you were speaking about you know, your watershed report, which was hot off the press, and I was so excited. I hoped you were talking about that because I got the email uh, just the other day about, about its release. I thought that was a really nice way to illustrate how you bring the science to the policy and advocacy and then drive it, you know, really drive it to the ground. Um, so that, that really, um, for me, it really resonated. Yeah, I, I have uh, to say I, Other oh. thing, for those... No, please go go ahead. No, it was um, it can be I think a bit alarming sometimes. I, I like how you said it was thought provoking because sometimes when I'm looking at these slides, I'm like, oh, it's just so overwhelming to me. But I think it's right is how can we for me, I find actually I become very grounded when I say there is this scary science over here and these are these very tangible actions that we can do on our land and in our waters to go <laughs> to move forward. I was also going to say, I'll take a really long time to answer any questions so that you can mute. We, we are good for time. So I'm, I'm actually thrilled that we get a chance to, to interact and have some conversation. Um, the other piece that I wanted to make an initial connection to, actually two more things. Um, for those of you that, that were with us uh, for our first speaker in our series, Brian Kahn, I mean, he was speaking um, about different ways of knowing and with local uh, plants that we have in our yards and in our gardens. And so, Liz, when you were talking about what's tractionable and how we can take action, that really, I think, is a nice tie-in with some of our, our other speakers, and in particular what Brian's message uh, was around different ways of knowing and what we can think about doing ourselves. So. I, I'm really fascinated. I'm definitely going to check out, you know, your garden app. And uh, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, and it's an ever-evolving um, program for us. And we'll definitely, we do have, um, we've connected to Native, Indigenous Native growers. And we also are expanding a program. We, we convinced Loblaw is one of our corporate, Loblaw, the grocery ch chain is one of our corporate partners and we convince them to sell native plants in Loblaw's store so that program will continue to expand but it's interesting I am actually it's a new program to me and just learning how hard it is to find native seeds um, we are at a deficit and how scary that we want to expand and provide it in the marketplace and we just can't grow fast enough because we've just decimated uh, local uh, wildlife and plant wildlife. And so how do we begin to regenerate that seed base and, up, and at the same time scale up? It's, I think, critical. And I think part of that for us is engaging with Indigenous, our Indigenous partners to say, hey, how how can we do this and you know how do you maintain the land and how can we respectfully complement that way of knowing you know liz the the connections here are just incredible uh cory brandt from npc who i believe is with us tonight 
uh, on online actually wrote us after that first presentation because the same question was asked uh, by one of our, our audience member, members. Where can I get you know, some of these seeds? Where can I get uh, source some of these, these plants? And so um, Corey provided uh, after to us a list of some of those places. And um, I know Amanda's working behind the scenes and maybe we can share some of those again with the viewer. Uh, the that last would be wonderful. I, oh, can you yeah. connect me with Corey too? I would love to have a chat with Corey. Absolutely. I am thrilled to do that. And uh, <laughs> the last thing I want to say, Liz, before I jump over to the audience, is at the outset of your presentation, you ask you know, people to identify where they're from. And so I thought it would be nice just to share a little bit about some of our viewers and, and our audience members. We had uh, Jessica tuning in from Lambton County, and that's the Kettle and Stony Point Ojibwe territory. We have Parker from Oakville, Jillian from Perry Sound, Eleanor from Cornwall, Judith from Niagara Falls. We have Judy Hudak tuning in from Connecticut, USA, and, and Julia Baird from St. Catharines. And that's just a, just a handful. Uh, I was trying to, to write them all down for you, but what I wanna say is just, how thrilling it is to have such a diverse uh, audience from such a diverse amount of places. And I was, I think that's really appropriate for your presentation where you're speaking about the national scale right down to our local scale. Yeah, I guess I'll just add to that is um, one of my biggest learnings at WW Canada, I came from working with small not-for-profits, kind of it local, and you know, a national platform can be so powerful. But again, like I mentioned earlier, people care because it's in their backyard. And so how can I um, recognize that it doesn't matter where we are in the country, there's locally relevant work to be done. Um, what we do in the Carolinian zone will be different than what we do in Nunavut. Um, but but we can ladder it up into a really powerful national story. So don't ever let people say, tell you that Canadians don't care about what's happening in their country in terms of our national world, because don't believe it. I see it across the country. It's so powerful. And, and I'm going to go one step further, Liz, and then I promise I'll, uh, I'll stop and get our audience questions here. Now they're starting to come up. Um, but I want to I take that one step further. I just found out Allison's tuning in from London. And also we have Marjorie joining us from Salt Lake City, Utah. And, and so, you know, it's certainly not just a Canadian uh, passion for fresh water and dealing with, with climate and, and biodiversity, um, you know, and, and certainly our, our American colleagues that are joining in tonight. Uh, we really appreciate that. And, and we know they're equally as passionate as, as us Canadians. Let me, uh, let me get here to our first question from the audience member. Um, Parker asked, is there any programs uh, equivalent to Garden Tracker for areas other than the Carolinian zone? We are going to be expanding into Southern Quebec next summer, um, but we will be over the next three years expanding across the country. It will be, I keep saying, it's going to be in the zone-esque. So it will be like we, so in our in the zone um, local partner we work with Carolinian Canada an amazing organization really top-notch um, obviously it wouldn't be appropriate for us to partner with Carolinian Canada in BC so we will be building out um, and taking a lot of our learnings um, to work with groups across the country um, yeah so WWF doesn't have it specifically also I would um, depending on what region you are I suspect there are types of projects. You can also, it doesn't matter where you are, you can use our in the zone tracker. Great. Thanks, Liz. The next question actually picks up on, on some of your comments, and I know how excited you are about the 2020 watershed reports that just came out. And so the question asks, to what extent does the World Wildlife Fund encourage or has projects that engages citizen scientists in trying to fill data gaps or build richer data sets for future watershed reports. And I see a huge smile on your face. 
Well, one, that is for sure a freshwater person speaking. And two, yes, we do encourage citizen science. So um, we released the Watershed Reports 2020 is actually a reassessment. We launched the first one in 2017, and it was far more devastating. We um, accompanied it with a threats assessment. It's basically like we are crucifying our watersheds and we don't know what's happening, but actually over just three years through programs where we engage community scientists, I'm working hard at not using citizen because not I'm trying to be inclusive and that's a tricky word. So in terms of engaging community science, we have been able to, our improvement in understanding watersheds has largely been driven by community science. So across the country, and I can definitely tell you, depending on where you are, what local water group you can join to help get out and monitor. But we have really seen this acceleration of groups getting out and monitoring. It's, you know, who knew people cared that much about Benthix? <laughs> and then we at WWF have a partnership with Living Lakes Canada, Environment Canada, University of Guelph to monitor benthic invertebrates. So we have our own monitoring programs, but also there's some amazing programs out there. Thanks, Liz. You'll be you'll be thrilled to know, and I know one of the challenges with this type of uh, virtual platform is you can't necessarily read all the comments as they're coming up, but that's, that's good. Otherwise, I'd be out of a job. Um, but I do want to let you know that there's a number of resources being shared uh, by our audience members uh, about where, where we can get some sources for some of the plants you were mentioning. And so um, obviously, you know, those will be part of the, the record you can see. Um, another question from, from David, um, you referenced 85% of Canadians live on 1% of the land. The majority of tourism activity also takes place in these more densely populated areas. What advice would you give tourists to be more mindful of their footprint when traveling? That's a great, that's a great question. Yeah. I'll give you a second, Liz, because there's a lot there. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's in the Carolinian Canada's 25% of the population is on 1% of the land. I, I think that was the statistic we're going with. Um, and yeah, that's a really excellent question. And again, I think we'll see, uh, I'm so curious what happened, the impact of COVID and what happens over the next couple of years, because, you know, the hiking trails in and around Toronto are packed on weekends and, you know, people are really getting out there. And, you know, I know people are really focused on the masks being dropped around, um, but yeah, tread lightly on the earth. You know, I think we really, um, I'm going to go there. I'm going to go to the vulnerability and say we need to tread lightly on the earth and we need to just recognize that when we drop stuff, it stays there. Plastics don't disintegrate, right? And it's all of our responsibilities to manage how we touch down. Thanks. Be Thanks, respectful Liz. I know. of the rules. If, if they say don't hike, don't hike. If there's Fences, don't climb fences. <laughs> Follow the rules of your That's, conservation authority. When I, I certainly know for our, our colleagues at uh, the Niagara Parks Commission that you know the the intense intense um, interest in getting out in nature, interacting, being present in green space uh, during COVID has has just been magnified. Um, and we're also, you know, seeing a very different type of user uh, visiting these areas than certainly we have at the past uh, with the Niagara Parks Commission land. And so I think, you know, the advice that you have is really sound. And the more that we can work together um, from a management perspective uh, to, to try to get through this and, and get the benefits of being out in nature without destroying it at the same time, I think that's you know, that's an incredibly uh, powerful message to, uh, to share. Can I add something to that too? I would also say, um, I think we can celebrate that people are getting outside. I think that is so incredible. And in terms of equity and 
education, not everyone has the same outdoor experiences and knowledge, right? So I think it's um, upon us, who, I mean, you know, maybe people who have spent their lives out on getting out in nature and maybe have a different education to recognize that I think people are probably right now doing the best they can. So if there's masks left on the ground or, you know, maybe more litter than we would like to see, I think it's helpful to remember it is a different audience. This is a really opportunity to be grateful that people are using green spaces, that there is this reawakening to the importance of green spaces and patience and humility, I think, can serve us well in building up this culture. We want to build up this culture. It's really exciting. Let's not um, take down something before it begins. And thanks, thanks, Liz. I mean, in your talk, and I think one of the really uh, inspirational pieces of of hope that you you offered and you shared with the audience in your talk was was around actionable change and the passion that you know you've gained through your 15 year career. And then you know if we think about people coming out now and trying you know engage with nature, how can we? And I think you used the word leverage. How do we leverage that passion that people have to start getting involved and in, and in making some of that actionable change? Um, Jessica wants to thank you, Liz, for a really inspiring talk. And I have a, another question here also that asks, how do we promote or create connected habitat fragments through private landowners or property? And so I know in your, in your talk, you were speaking about, and, and being a resident of Niagara, I totally understand that most of our property is held privately. And of course, that means it's highly fragmented and you have lots of people making decisions. And I know one of our Masters of Sustainability students, uh, Brooke Capeller, is actually doing her work on stewardship and how we foster that to, to think about connecting some of that. But I think this is a great question about how can we connect some of those habitated fragments when we have private landowners? Yeah, and I'm going to do a... Sh there's a few parts to this answer. So I guess the unpopular, but trying for myself in terms of my own reconciliation journey, recognizing private land is a really um, colonial concept. And how do, you know, it maybe hasn't served us as well as we think it might have in terms of the crisis we're facing. So. How do we reconcile in ourselves this idea of that we can own the earth? Um, so I'm not suggesting we're going to solve that tonight or in the next couple years, but that's just part of my thinking is like, oh, well, we've really gotten ourselves into this conundrum of when we have this concept of private land. But I also, you know, there are great programs out there. So NCC, there are, you know, land trusts, that uh, we can promote. I think it is cultural awareness. I think um, another study that would be so cool, maybe Brock University could pick this up, another master super, it was like, how has stewardship shifted because of COVID? You know, maybe, oh, if I had to design a study, how about Conservation Authority or the Land Trust, Niagara's um, Parks Commission, surveys folks who are engaging on their land in, this year and in like every two years or something and like is the idea of stewardship changing over time as people populations increase their use i think that would be really neat to follow because i do feel like this is a golden you know of the very many crazy things about covid i think this is actually a bit of a golden moment to inspire stewardship of our land um and then promotion, right? If you see, you know, humans crave, we need connection. And when you see your community and your neighbors doing something, I do believe people want to try and connect to that. And so what we put out in the world is what we receive. So I think there is opportunity through these small actions to begin to get that connectivity that we need for our habitat and wildlife. It's slow though. It's that's the p hard part about private land is it is will be the slow transformation. 
Liz, that was a beautiful segue into, into our last uh, question here. And uh, so we have one last audience question. I have one question for you, and then, uh, and then we'll give the last word to you. Um, the, the last audience question, and it, it ties in really nicely to the point you just made, asks, how do we convince municipalities to plant native perennials instead of the current annuals that they plant? Hmm. So I do know we are with Carolinian Canada making headway on those discussions. So it's happening. I know municipalities are slowly uh, gaining an interest. I think there's a bit of let's educate the groundskeepers. I, and it's not just a political choice. I think it's also what's easier for the staff who are working on it. So sometimes what seems like a easy solution, you know, we've had circumstances in some of our work where it's like, just get the politicians to say they want this to happen. But at the end of the day, there's a human being who has to make that change happen. And, you know, how can we get, how can we facilitate that human being to be on board? And so I think we have to pull various levers that those discussions are happening. We've presented at municipality uh, conferences, the um, er, um, rural municipal association we've presented there. So I, th I think we're seeing traction, but again, it's like also call, you know, get one of my comments was get your voice heard. And that's a great thing to call your municipality and say, hey, why can't we have perennials? Like this is something we can do. And so we do have to do, ask for what we want. I like that, and I think it uh, it leads a, a really nice into kind of my my question, but at the same time wanting to give you to give you the last word um, before I just do a, a nice wrap up here with some housekeeping. But I guess my question for you, Liz, and and kind of the last uh, last word that maybe perhaps you want to leave uh, our our audience with. I was really uh, taken with your talk of how you were able to transition between these very heavy subjects uh, that, that, as you've said multiple times, can be, you know, can be negative, can get you down. And then very quickly you transition to the hope and the positivity of engaging with people and partnerships and actually, you know, doing actionable things to make a difference. And so my question for you, because um, I always have a pile of questions in case our audience doesn't, but we have a wonderful audience and they always have hundreds of questions. Um, is is what gives you hope, Liz? Mm. Um, I guess this isn't even a... I just see change happening all the time, and it's really incredible. We see generational change, you know, if you often talk in multi-generational, um, I'm fortunate that I have a multi-generational network of friends and family and professional uh, world and see the changes and progressions we have made, uh, both at the local level and um, higher, like provincial or national levels. And then um, I do also internationally, sometimes I engage with my international colleagues at WWF and can see the amazing, like, <laughs> you know, it's easy to say, oh, Canada, we're so different from Argentina or uh, Brazil or African, Sub-Saharan African countries. But talking with my colleagues about, well, how do you measure water? and What's your government? Often we actually have the same barriers. And so, you know, no matter where humans are, we kind of are, we all want the same thing. We just maybe are getting, trying to get at it differently. And that's exciting. And I guess the last piece, like how can that be exciting is because <laughs> for me, and it's a bit of why I'm so hopeful is that if we knew what we were doing, we would have the answers and we don't. So we get to create every day. I get to wake up and kind of, as long as I'm not doing HR work, I get to create really exciting solutions and try out different things because there is no right path. And I think pretending there's one way to make change in this world 
is depressing, but I just know, like, I will sing it from the mountaintops that there's just like, we don't have one solution. And so that just is a huge opportunity. And it's, yeah, yeah very creative. It's so exciting. How creative can we be? Liz, I think that's a wonderful way to, to end tonight on. On behalf of, of Brock and the Niagara Parks Commission, as well as all of our audience members, I want to say thank you so much for your inspiring talk. I know it's a challenge to do this virtually because you can't hear the applause in the background and see the enthusiasm on people's play, uh, face, but please believe me, it's there, and, and we're all very appreciative of the wisdom and knowledge you've shared with us tonight. Our, our sincere thanks. I just want to thank what I... Brock University and the Niagara Commission, I, it is a unique partnership. And I think, you know, talking about different ways of, and different partnerships and unique ways of approaching local issues, like, I just think it's an amazing example of what you're trying to do. And I was feeling a bit grumpy about the online exchange. I much prefer people, but I am actually really excited about the attendee list and like Utah or Connecticut, like all over, like, like, that wouldn't have happened if we were face to face. So I just, yeah, it's exciting that people are connecting in different ways. And um, thank you. And this is, and if anyone has any questions, uh, maybe there's a email address. Happy to have further conversation with anyone. But thank you so much for your time this evening. I know everyone's busy, and it can be hard to spend more time in front of a screen these days. Thanks so much, Liz. Thank you. Have a good night. I will, and so before before I sign off, I just want to uh, remind everyone that our final speaker in our environmental seminar series is on October 28th at 7 p.m. And we're joined next week by Adam Schultz, who's the Explorer in Residence of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society. And Adam's gonna be speaking on Beyond the Trees, a journey alone across Canadian Canada's Arctic. I hope that you'll all consider joining us next week. I, I thank you for joining us this evening, and I hope you have a wonderful evening and best wishes for the coming week. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Liz.